Okay, so I'm going to talk, funnily enough, about simplicity and how it relates to technology. <laughs> and the reason I'm doing that is because I think simplicity is actually uh, really important when we design technology, especially if we think of the future in about 10 years' time. And so, like Todd said, I'm a designer, so for the last 20 years I've been working as designing new products and services. But also, I'm a consumer, like everyone in the room, and I'm still amazed about how notoriously difficult technology is to use. And this was not faked and rigged, I promise you. <laughs> um, and when I use technology, I often find myself actually quite bewildered, lost, and confused. And people usually laugh at me when I say it, because they're like, well, you designed this stuff, so surely if anyone can use it, you can. But um, I still find it very confusing. And I actually predict that things are going to get a lot more complex in the next 10 years, and I'll try and explain why. And it concerns me a lot, and it concerns me every day in the job I do. And I don't believe that I'm the only one. In fact, um, the, author and, um, the author Don Norman talks about how there are many cries for simplicity in our lives, from the activities we pursue, the possessions we own, and especially the technologies we use. And so what do I think life will be like in 10 years' time? Well, experts say, and probably most of you know in this room, they say that we're going to be living in the cloud by 2020. And for those that don't know what we mean by when we reference the cloud, it's just a metaphor for anything, that, uh, communication with the uh, internet. So basically, they're talking about having computational power, my data, sharing data with people through the cloud. Now, other experts are saying that by 2020, though, we'll be living with about 50 billion devices, connected devices, and so the Internet of Things, as they call it, will become a reality. And by the Internet of Things, what that means is that devices will all have their own IP address, including my fridge, apparently. How important that is, I don't know. So to give you a context of how many devices, connected devices there'll be, if we think in 2020, they estimate that it's going to be about 8.8 .8 billion people on the planet. So still, you know, let's think about 50 billion devices in relationship to that. And if I jump back to what's happening today, um, according to Ofcom's um, annual communication report this year, they're talking about people already spending 45% of their time connected. And that's actually half of our waking hours. And we're consuming, on average, certainly not me, but uh, about eight hours and 48 minutes of media a day. And actually, some of the younger generation are managing to cram that amount of media into seven hours, which, when I first read that, I thought was actually impossible. But um, what they're doing is what they call uh, media multitasking, so they're doing several things at once. So they're consuming media at the same time, listening to things and surfing the internet at the same time. And so if this is my life now, and these are some of the devices that I have in my life now and the services that I'm using, what's it going to be like in 20, 10 years' time, in 2020? And when I look at how everything's going to become connected um, and everything's going to exist in what they call an ecosystem of smart devices, then I kind of think, well, something has to change because already I find the services and devices in my life pretty confusing to use. And I'm worried that my my life will become a bit overwhelming. And what kind of still irritates me about the design of new technologies, I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how to make it work, <laughs> this being a perfect example. And I feel like my time is very precious, and I'm sure you do too. Um, and some say that you can measure the amount of complexity in something by the amount of time it takes you to learn it. And I'm being a bit facetious here, but I, if I reference back to when I learned how to drive 20 years ago, it took me roughly about 20 hours to learn how to drive. I had about eight hours of driving lessons, and my dad spent 12 hours with me. But uh, strangely enough, I also recently spent 20 hours learning how to use one of my phones. And I actually carry three phones with me most of the time. And to me, spending 20 hours learning how to use just one device is a complete waste of my time, and it shouldn't be happening. And so what I personally want is more simplicity in my life. And so I'm going to talk about some of the myths surrounding technology and why we might be thinking that technology is always going to be complex. Some people say that technology is so complex you can never make it simple, and I don't agree. And then I'm going to talk about some strategies, just three strategies, where I hope that maybe going in that direction might help us deliver more kind of simple te technical life in the future. 
So simplicity is really easy to understand as a concept. The definition is it's easy to understand, easy to do. The uh, design is pretty plain and uncomplicated. And so these things here we would consider to be very simple objects. Of course they are. Um, they're easy to understand how to use. You just look at them and we all recognize how to pick them up and use them. But this is not. This is notoriously seen by most people as one of the hardest objects to use, actually. And I've deliberately chosen a VCR from the 1980s because this is when the whole problem with feature creep started to happen. And so one of the things we've um, actually come across in the last 20 years when we're designing new technology devices is we have experienced a lot of feature creep. And in fact, there's a term for that, and it's called featureitis. And it's when, 20 years ago, when companies and designers started to just load as many features as possible into the devices, just because it was technically possible to do it. And so I think that's kind of set some people's expectations that that's just how technology is going to be. But actually, when you ask people, like I have done, how many features they actually use on their remote control, a very simple object, out of the 100% of features available, on average, people use about 15%, and it's pretty standard across the board, including myself. And I put this in, actually, because it's a really nice human story about how someone tried to do a workaround themselves of the problem. So hopefully you can see it, but this is actually a, an image and a story I've taken from Bill Mogridge's uh, website for the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York. And he said that there was a lady who was um, allowing a friend to stay in her house for the weekend while she was going away. And to be kind, as a host, she decided to cover her remote controls with paper and cut out little holes for the buttons that were important and basically conceal all the rest. So, you know, people have nice strategies of solving the problem. And so Don Norman says in his book, The Design of Everyday Things, that actually if you double the number of features, you quadruple the complexity. So if you add 10 times more features, you're going to increase the complexity by 100. So, again, if I look to the future and how many devices are going to be in my life, then I see it as very, very complex. So, one of the myths around technology as well is that it will always be complex, but I don't believe that's true either. And I've deliberately taken two products direct, directly related to each other, the camcorder on the left, which is a standard camcorder, uh, recording video that most people probably use, I've used it myself, find it appallingly complex, versus the product on the right, and I don't know whether anyone has used this product or heard of it, called the flip camera. And I bought it two years ago because when I heard that it was on the market, I thought, what a brilliant idea. You get rid of all the buttons and the complexity and reduce it down to what's really required by people, which is basically just shoot a video and then possibly edit it and send it to a friend. And what's nice about the controls on the flip video camera is it's very small. It's about the size of a mobile phone. Back then, it ran on AA batteries, so you didn't even need a cable to connect it and charge it. But the controls are so simple, all you have to do is press the red button in the middle to, to record, press it again when you want to stop, and actually all the controls around that red button only illuminate when they're needed. And that's a really nice feature where you're basically, buttons know when they're not needed and when they are needed, and they just disappear, so it avoids the clutter and complexity for me as a user. And what it does is it also allows people just to focus on the goal of what they're trying to do. And in this case, it's just allowing people to capture moments really quickly and share those memories rather than figuring out how something works. The second thing, oops, the second thing is people don't really want to buy simple stuff. Now, I've, uh, I've heard this before and I've read quite a lot about it that people say, yeah, but simplicity doesn't sell. You know, people like complex things, and so they wouldn't buy something like this. In fact, most people only use a few programs on their washing machine as well. Um, and the reason being is that they say that when we go into a store to buy something, we're looking for things with lots of features because we think that somehow that's going to be more powerful than anything else. And also, if you uh, understand how people shop, is that they go for complicated things mainly because they don't understand that what the features mean anyway when they first look at them. And so they think, well, I'll buy the most complicated thing and try and figure out the features later. And of course, they rarely do. So this kind of argument that we don't buy simplicity is not actually true. And I think one of the workarounds for that, I don't know whether you can see the image, this is of the Apple store. And what, of course, Apple are very good at creating simplicity in their products and their services. 
But actually what they do is allow people to go into their store and try all their products, and people can hang out there for hours trying their products. And that basically, what that allows people to do is understand the features that are there and decide which ones they actually don't need. And I think by default, that means we buy more simpler things. So I'm going to quickly talk about some uh, strategy, just three strategies that uh, I think might help in the design of more simpler technology devices. So the first is consistency. So this is actually um, some products that were done by HP. And five years ago, Hewlett Packard looked at their whole product range and realized that every single control they produced was slightly different. And what happens is that they're asking all their customers to learn each control individually every time they come across a Hewlett Packard product. And they also found out that, in fact, their software was exactly the same. And what they did is it took them three years to audit every single product on their product range. And they created what they called the HPQ control, the thing on the right, shaped like a Q. And they put it on every single product. And if you use a HP product now, it will have this control interface on it. And they even followed the logic through to the software. So the logic, underlying logic remains the same. So that's one way to create a very simple, keep consistency across all your devices. And the reason I think that's important in the future, in the next 10 years, is because if we think about all our content being in the cloud, and it's being accessed by multiple devices that I may own, and I might even choose to buy those devices, all one from, from one company, say Sony or Samsung, so they have a duty for me as a consumer to provide some kind of uh, consistency of experience across all the devices they produce, rather than expecting me to learn a different uh, logic each time I come across their devices. The second one is let experiences grow with people. And already technology, like we know, in Amazon in this case, we all probably used Amazon, technology is cleverly in the background figuring out how I'm browsing, what I'm clicking on, what content interests me, and is intelligently working out how to make recommendations to me. And actually what I discovered quite by accident is one of the phones I've been using for the last six months is called the Vodafone 360. And I road test a lot of technology, so I lived with it for about six months. And then the first three weeks, what I found out was it was reconfiguring the software on my phone without me knowing into something that was easier for me to understand. And that was a very nice feature for me to discover. Um, and basically what it means is I have about 3,000 contacts in my contact address book. And on this phone, it actually presents my contacts as people's faces, which is a very nice visual way of doing it. And what it did is over time, it recognized who I was calling the most and who I was texting the most, found them in my 3,000 contact address book, and pushed all their faces to the front of my phone and my address book which basically meant every time I turned my phone on, all my friends' faces appeared, and it was very easy for me to contact them. So that's what I mean by technology being very clever in the background and figuring out how to make the best features for me. And so even though I also use an Apple uh, iPhone, and I love my Apple iPhone, it's very simple to use, but it still is presenting me with a lot of features, really. It's just software rather than buttons now. Um, and even though you know, I can have thousands of apps now, actually what I'm using is still only about 15% of the capacity of this software. And if I could reconfigure, or the, sorry, the technology can reconfigure in the background based on my actual natural behavior, which is mainly I set the alarm clock, I check my calendar, I write SMSs, possibly change the settings, and everything else I don't really bother using. So I think this provides this kind of intelligence that technology can have working in the background, just tracking my behavior, and slowly over time tailoring my experience, especially for me. And when I, I, I kind of usually talk about bespoke experiences, and what I mean by this is, it's the same as if you walked into a tailor's and bought yourself a, a, a one-off tailored suit. It's like a bespoke suit, rather than going to a store and buying a suit off, off the shelf or off the peg that is made for everyone. And I think that's how experiences in the future should be, is that technology is working in the background intelligently to make an experience that's very relevant for me. And the last one, before I finish, is keep it real. And this one, I talk about how um, technology should be playing more on the clues and uh, the physical objects supply us in the world. So when you look at a bunch of tools like this, 
over hundreds and hundreds of years as humans, we've decided how to decipher these tools and figure out how they're actually used. So just by looking at a pair of scissors, intuitively you know where to put your hands and how to use them. And that's pretty standard for most physical objects. And we use the word affordances there. But in the digital world, it's a little bit more hard to have affordances. And this is especially true when most of our experiences are now going to happen on screen and they're not so physical anymore. But I think what's interesting now, and is a great opportunity to for creating more simple experiences, is that these kind of devices even now, it's the Apple iPhone again, they have so many sensors inside them that they actually are very intelligent things. And it's connected to a very intelligent network as well. And what that allows us to potentially think of is imagine if, for instance, um, I, I have a friend, I meet her in the cafe, and just by placing our phones together, rather than me having to go through loads of menus to send her a photo, placing the phones together, automatically I flick the content over to her phone. And the same thing is, imagine if I was on a video call with my sister, and I walk into my home, my device immediately detects that I'm back home because I'm suddenly on my home network, and I, I'm on the video call with my sister on this screen, but just by moving over to my plasma screen, it automatically detects that I'm next to my plasma screen and shifts my video call straight to the plasma, again, without me having to do anything. I don't have to go uh, menu, figure out how to send it to my plasma screen. So what I'm trying to say here is, these intelligent devices that are now context aware, they know proximity to other devices, they know proximity to other people in my life, they know how to share content and who with because I'm effectively connected to friends and family on networks and that information's in the cloud and these objects access that data. And lastly, every night when I go to bed, I always think, why am I having to go through the same procedure every night of turning my phone onto silent and setting the alarm at exactly the same time that I do every day. Why can't the object just, and it could do this now actually, because there's an accelerometer in here, is just I turn it over face down and that action automatically turns it to silent and puts the alarm on. And again, people might say, yeah, but how does that work? You say, well, the systems will now in the future understand that on average I go to bed at 12 o'clock in the week it knows what time of day it is, it knows what day it is, it knows I'm in my bedroom even, and putting all those together, it can start to be intelligent enough to figure out the rough behavior that I desire. And so like I said, devices are, have the potential to give us a much more simple experience because they are connected to a net, clever networks, they're very smart devices with sensors inside them, and technology can enable all this to happen. And so I just want to end on, for me, I think it's really important to say that even though technology is fantastic, we really have to focus on not what can technology do for us, but basically what technology should do for us. And that's it. Thanks. Thanks.